up, begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father, Lord, thank you for um, for another uh, beautiful day for us, Lord, uh, to come to worship you. Um, it certainly has gotten a lot colder, uh, but I just pray, Lord, that um, that we would be able to enjoy this uh, new season, this uh, colder weather, uh, as in as another period of time in our lives, and I just pray, Lord, that um, you'll help us in our lives, whether it's in school or. Um, just living even just the, the Christian life, uh, being your disciples, Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would uh, give us the, uh, the drive to, to serve you, to worship you, and to follow you all the days of our lives. Uh, I pray, Lord, that as we go into your word, as we look at your words, Lord, um, that uh, you would speak to us, Lord. You would speak to us through your spirit. Uh, you would help us to understand your word and uh, to also just, you know, recognize our purpose in this life. Uh, and I pray all this in the name of Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right. So I hope this isn't too out there, but I'm going to be introducing our topic for today with a small example from a show I've talked about before, Doctor Who. Uh, yes, the show about that human-looking alien known as the Doctor, who goes on all these adventures using... Mm -hmm. The spaceship slash time machine thing. It's a box. It's a blue box, and it goes wherever he wants it to go. In the ninth season of this particular series, uh, there's always been uh, there was one always one phrase that uh, instantly caught my attention whenever it was spoken. Uh, it was on purpose, of course. It's not like it was just a. It's not like it was something that uh, that I specifically got hung up on. It's something that the writers of the show um, were trying to, you know, repeat and reiterate and and uh, make it recognizable and memorable, uh, perhaps as uh, one of the themes, the main themes of that season. Every season there's like a main arc and and there's uh, certain themes that, that run through it. And for the ninth season, um, the Doctor would often say to his friend, his companion, uh, you do as you are told. If you haven't seen anything about Doctor Who, you may be wondering why this is said. Uh, well, within the context of the show, the Doctor always ends up in all these very dangerous situations. I mean, uh, he's an alien, and of course, they're, they always deal with aliens and robots and, and things that are trying to take over the world or, or enslave the human race, whatever. Um, <clears throat> And so he, he's, the doctor always ends up in these very dangerous situations, and he all, but he also always has some relatively normal human friend that comes along for the ride. And depending on the severity of the situation, he may try and tell his friend, uh, his companion, to, to play it safe, to be safe. Because when things are really crazy, they may just be out of his control, and which is almost all the time, and and so his the doctor might fear for the safety of his companion and tell his friends to go hide in, in the time machine, which is called the TARDIS, or he may just kind of warn them, you know, don't do anything risky, don't go and and try out these these things that may even be life threatening. Um, so for the ninth season, whenever his friend uh, Clara would refuse to listen to him for whatever reason, or perhaps she just she wanted she wanted to do something to either help him, um, she wanted to stay by him, uh, and he clearly felt that there was some danger involved, perhaps could even get her killed. The doctor would tell her to go to hide or to go back. Uh, or to stay back and not to follow him. And when she refused, he would just tell her, you do as you are told. Okay, kind of very forcefully trying to get her to obey for her own safety. Now, have you ever heard that phrase before? I mean, it's an, it's an actual saying for sure, but I can't imagine any of you being told uh, this specifically. 
It's just not something most people would say to anyone else. Like, you, for example, you wouldn't say it to a friend, because that would be kind of awkward. Um, you wouldn't say it to a classmate or a coworker. And even school teachers, though they have some form of authority over you, uh, they're, they're probably not going to say something like this to you, or at least I don't think that they would. Um, they'd probably be a lot of complaints uh, <clears throat> if, if they did say something like that, because uh, first of all, this phrase just sounds really condescending. Um, you do as you are told. It's almost like a, a threat, you know, like uh, if some pushy bully were kind of ordering you to do something you don't want to do, or um, or you know some, or so perhaps uh, if someone's trying to be manipulative, they they may try to force you to do something that you don't want to do. Um, of course, it's not meant to have such a negative connotation. Um, I mean, if you if you look it up, it's really supposed to be something more for parents to tell their children when they are young and perhaps disobedient, um, or maybe even for siblings to tell one another when. Um, when the other sibling is clearly doing something that's uh, not right. Um, and so it's kind of like, you know, a way of kind of enforcing, reinforcing that you got to be obedient. You got to do as you are told. Um, but in all other cases, all other situations, telling someone to do as they are told probably won't be met with a great response. Uh, People may see it as, you know, um, controlling, or and, and certainly people don't like to be controlled, so they might have an urge to fight back when instructed to do something in a specific way. <clears throat> anyway, as we proceed with the message for today, just keep that phrase in the back of your mind. Um, now let's get to the Bible. Now last week, we were talking about uh, Rahab. Now, Rahab was pretty much uh, an unlikely biblical heroine, right? Uh, for the most part, during these messages, we like to focus and talk about uh, primarily Israelites, or sometimes they're called Hebrews, especially in regards to the Old Testament. But Rahab is one of those exceptions. Even though this is the Old Testament, she was not an Israelite. And even more surprising, she was a prostitute, so she's a prostitute foreigner, um, not someone that uh, the Bible usually puts um, at, in, in the spotlight. But because of her actions, the lives of these Israelite spies were spared. The, if you remember, the, Joshua sent two spies to investigate, and they went to the city of Jericho, Jericho, and somehow they were discovered, their cover was blown, and when they went to hide in Rahab's house, she helped them get away. Now we're going to continue following this story. The Israelites have spied out Jericho, but now what? How will the Israelites fight against them? They got, they, they checked out the place. How will, they, how will they win against a fortified city? Uh, we're gonna begin by reading uh, Joshua chapter three. And this is gonna be a fairly significant reading um, from verse 9 to verse 17. <clears throat> it reads, Joshua said to the Israelites, come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. This is how you will know that the living God is among you and that he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Girgashites, Amorites, and Jebusites. See, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Now then, choose twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. And as soon as the priests who carry the Ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood stage, all during harvest. Yet, as soon as the priests who carried the Ark reached the Jordan, and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away, 
at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarathon. While the water flowing down to the Sea of Araba, uh, that is the Dead Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. The, the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed crossing on dry ground. All right, so this is sort of just an introduction into our story. This is not the main part. Um, but to start with, we get a miracle. Last week, they sent just two spies uh, to check out the land. And so two spies, you know, getting across the Jordan River, um, simple enough. But now, I mean, they need everyone else. And so getting the whole nation across normally is another story. Fortunately for them, they had God on their side. Now, of course, I mean, to make it clear, it's, it was probably not impossible for the nation to cross over and reach Jericho normally, but maybe they would have to, have to take a longer route or maybe just, just take a really long time to get everyone over. You know, it can be um, a lot more difficult when, when you have to bring along an entire nation. God, on the other hand, he made things quick and simple. Um, very, uh, This miracle here might resemble another one that you might remember um, of how God parted the Red Sea. Now, again, God dried up the Jordan. Just the, the Jordan is supposed to be flooding, but God just dries it up. And this great miracle, um, before the sight of the Israelites, they really, it really strengthened their faith in God. After they saw this, they were really, um, they were really impacted by it. And even, um, it, uh, we're, I don't think we read this part, but even it says that the other, uh, whoops, hold on. <clears throat> but it, it says that even the other kings that uh, heard about it, the, the other nations, like the, the ones that they talked about, the Amorites and so so on and so forth. When they heard about this, they were shaking in fear. Their hearts melted in fear. And and so they and so this is you know this isn't some um, just you know a rare occurrence that just happens every once and so often or every once and so often. It's impossible. And so the the other armies um, recognize this. So the enemy army, enemy army, they become demoralized by this great miracle. And the Israelite army, they become full of faith and courage, right? Um, two weeks ago, we, we were talking about, you know, be strong and courageous. And they, that's, the, that's, their, that's uh, what they were chanting, you know, be strong and courageous. So here they are, the Israelite army, it sounds like they got an easy win. They've got this. But what does God tell the Israelite army to do next? I mean, you'd think that maybe they should just rush in, right? That's what we would normally expect. Go, go and get them. There should be nothing to fear. I mean, when you're full of confidence, when you got everything under control, it should be easy. I mean, you ever experienced that? You ever experienced that, that feeling, that moment where it's like everything just clicks and, and you feel like there's no way you can fail, no way you can lose? It's... Uh, I'm sure that's what the Israelites must have been feeling right here. The war might as well be over. God is on their side. They are in the presence of God. They can't lose. But they don't, they don't just, you know, take all this momentum, all this confidence, and just barge right through. They wait. They listen for God's orders. They obey God in every aspect. And so let's see what God tells them to do. This is Joshua 6, 1 to 5. Now the gates of Jericho were se securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horn in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. 
and that the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up, everyone straight in. All right, so the people here are ready for God's commands. And this is what God gives them. If you're reading this for the first time, you might be somewhat confused by what, what you read here. I mean, what does God tell them to do? What is God's command? Well, let's break it down. Kind of quick, simple, easy. God tells them, march around the city once a day for six days. And on the seventh day, march around seven times with trumpets blowing. Then shout and the walls will collapse uh, and everything's ready for it to take it. Everything's ready to, for, for them to just sweep up and, and, and finish it off. That's it. That's all. And when you read it, I mean, what, what God commands them to do, it doesn't really make any sense. Uh, it, it's basically like a ritual, a ceremony. It's not what one would expect as a tactic for war. Um, they're just marching around and around. They, they march once every day, and then the seventh, on the seventh day, they just march more. They do it for almost a week. It's just a week of just going there and marching and, and every day just marching and, and marching. It's like they're taunting. I mean, um, strategically, it doesn't sound like a great idea. I mean, they basically leave themselves wide open to getting shot at by arrows, you know, march around the city. Um, the enemy can see you from, from the walls. They can attack you if they want. Um, and if, especially if you come back every single day, I mean, it's like... It, it sounds like a bad idea. It's like they're letting the enemy know when they will arrive and what they will do, and which is just march every single day. And they have to march in a very specific way also. It's all very strange, and it really doesn't make much sense. I mean, let's put this in another perspective. I mean, it's like if you were playing basketball and, and you're ready for the game, right? You're, you're ready to play. The whole team is pumped up and ready to win. Your, your whole team has been practicing really hard for months. You, it's, it's almost like this is, this, this is the, the moment you've been waiting for, the moment you've been practicing for. You know you're gonna play your best. I mean, right away, you, this looks and feels like an easy win. You see the other team while they're quivering in their shoes, their knees are knocking together, they may, maybe even look faint. In their minds, you can tell there are parts. The coach calls the whole team over and proceeds to give instructions. You listen to what he's saying, and it ends up sounding like nonsense. He doesn't tell you to steal the ball, he doesn't tell you to shoot any hoops. Instead, the coach just orders you to dance back and forth, maybe sing a song, and do a bunch of silly hand signals. Ridiculous, right? Yeah. But the Israelites here trust in their coach. They put their trust in their God. They don't doubt and don't question uh, the fact that they're really not, for a whole week, they're really not fighting any kind of war. They're just following these instructions to a T, no matter how silly it sounds. And the end result is in verse 20. When the trumpet sounded, the army shouted, and at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So everyone charged straight in, and they took the city. It worked out just as God had said. This is just one of those things that don't really make any sense. I mean, you, you can try to come up with explanations. Uh, I'm sure science, scientists will have tried to come up with a bunch of explanations. Maybe the marching weakened the ground. Maybe it was like muddy and, and the walls just uh, kind of started falling apart. Maybe the, all, maybe the walls were really old and the noise from the shouting and the trumpets uh, resonated and who knows what, or maybe the combination of both. But it still won't make any sense. And if it had made any sense at all, then this probably would have been some sort of popular strategy for war throughout early human history. Uh, we wouldn't need the, the ballista, we wouldn't need catapults, right? We wouldn't need cannons or gunpowder, just, just march. March around and shout really loud. And, and then all your walls of the enemies will come tumbling down. Nobody does that, right? Nobody else tried to do this. It doesn't work. This is not some plan that just sounds weird and works, like you know how, how a lot of things today, um, we can hear about things that just sound weird but are, are true. This is one of those things that sound weird and does not work at all. This was a miracle, something that should not have worked. For us, as we're reading it, 
we're just going to have to be in awe that it worked. But for the Israelites that had to do this at that time, it must have been a really confusing thing for them. They were ready to fight. But instead, it's like one week of, of uh, exercise, just walking around. <laughs> the Bible is full of amazing stories. And a lot of them do make sense. Um, just like when Cain murdered Abel out of jealousy. We can see that happening even today. Um, no, there's no surprise there. Uh, when jo Joseph had to endure slavery so he could re one day rescue his family from famine, it, I mean, if we look at it normally, it seems kind of crazy, but it, we see that through God's plan, it worked out um, perfectly. There's some method to that madness. And of course, when God saw that we were dead in our sins, God sent us Jesus Christ, die on the cross as the perfect sacrifice. Um, because it's like, uh, there's nothing we can do, but there's something that God can do for us. We see a perfect plan there. And then of course, there are a lot of commands that God tells us that do make sense. Quite simply, don't murder, don't steal, don't covet. We can, we can look at those commands and say, okay, th those, those make sense. But then occasionally we see things like this. These were direct commands given by God. And they had to obey these commands because it's just the way that God wanted them to obey. God gave them a choice. And we are also faced with that choice every day of our lives, to obey or not to obey. And just here, God shows the consequences of both actions in this book. God gave them commands that seemed like some strange ritual. Um, and when they obeyed this weird set of commands, just followed it, the, they won the war. And if they didn't follow it, um, later on in the next chapter even, someone disobeys God, does something he shouldn't do, and the whole Israelite nation started to lose the war. And this really just goes back to our talk in James a few weeks ago, James 1.22. It says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Of course, it's always hard to obey God perfectly. And sometimes we hesitate on certain commands because it doesn't always make sense to us. Of course, it's not wrong to try and make sense of what God commands, but we can't always expect it to make sense. But when God's commands are clear and precise, we should take notice and obey. When God tells us to do something, we just need to do as we are told. Uh, with that, let's end in a word of prayer. Dearly Father, uh, thank you for your word. Um, allow us to really, you know, follow it. Follow it, its instructions. Uh, we, uh, I, I believe we recently read a psalm where it talks about how, how we need to really meditate on your word and, and, and come to love it, Lord. And I just pray, Lord, that uh, we would come to love your word, that we would find meaning in it, we would find hope, we would find strength for each and every day. Um, and I just pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.